Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. All right. I'm, I'm trying to stay slightly quiet since I have sleeping children in the next room. But uh, if you can't hear me, please, please let me know. Um, okay. So I'm really sad that I agreed to go second because Andrew just did such a fantastic job and I have no slides or really preparation. Um, well, you know, that's why Chase was, I think, hitting the emphasis on professor so that you guys don't have expectations that are too high. Because, yeah. Um, okay. So hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, and in this view, yes. I can't really see chats as they flip by. So if you want to get my attention, please just yell. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today uh, is the, a workflow that I've developed for um, using tools that I'm sure many of you um, use day to day. Uh, and specifically, this is targeted towards producing um, publication stuff, stuff for publications and stuff for lecture notes slash slides um, that are mathematically derivation heavy. Uh, and so as a motivating example, I'm just going to step through um, something that I did for a recent lecture, which is uh, was the derivation of Lagrange's planetary equations. Uh, for those of you whose dynamics might be a little stale, those are just the um, equation, differential set of differential equations that describe how uh, two body uh, orbits are modified by perturbing potentials. So when you have pure conservative forces and you have a potential description of the perturbation, um, Lagrange's equations give you a uh, a really nice first order differential form in all of the Keplerian orbital elements. So you see the variation in time of the semi major axis and eccentricity and the Euler angles and the rest. Uh, and the reason why I think it's a good motivating example is just because um, it's annoying to write out by hand, super annoying, and it has a couple of linear algebra steps that you know anybody in their right mind would instantly want to offload to a computer. So the fundamental tool that I'm using is a SymPy. Uh, SymPy is a, a really nice um, Python module available on pip and everywhere else that you normally get Python stuff. Um, I have also added a bunch of wrappers around SymPy because I am horribly anal about my notation and I want it to look a very, very specific way. Um, so on top of SymPy, I've implemented something, just a set of very simple scripts called SymPy helpers, um, which hopefully you can see here. They are available in a GitHub repo, uh, um, which I had pulled up. Oh, here we go. So I have a GitHub repo under my username, and I think Chase sends out notes on these things. So he will, I will give him the link. But um, I have just a random repository called the MiskPy. And under there is a bunch of useful things, including something called SymPy helpers. Um, and I'll go into what those are for, but they're a very, very light layer on top of SymPy that just helps me get notationally the, the kind of outputs that I want for my purposes. Uh, and it also implements a, um, a bunch of useful things for doing dynamics and especially Newton Euler dynamics, because again, I'm very particular about how I want those things to look. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that very much today, but, but I can get into it if anybody's interested. Um, so one of the main things, um, SymPy is a full uh, symbolic tool, uh, a symbolic package, so you can do all the usual calculus and algebra that you would expect. Uh, one of the things I find slightly annoying about it is that if you want to differentiate things, you have to define things as functions of the thing that you're differentiating with respect to. That seems kind of like an obvious thing, but you get notated. I should pause and say, can everybody read this or should I bump up? Is this okay? Yeah. Okay. So, um, thank you. Um, so you get, right, you can define things, you get things like x is a function of t. Um, and so then from then on, you're going to carry this annoying t around. And so every time you do something really simple, like the differential of x squared with respect to t, you will just be carrying massive amounts of these t's. And to me, it looks horrible and unwieldy. And so instead of this, I would prefer to just use over dot or over bar or whatever notation. Um, and of course, it's really hard to convince SymPy that that's the right way of doing things, that it should differentiate things with dependent, dependent variables, even if I haven't declared the dependency. So the way to get around this is to um, define a total differential function, which I'm not going to read through, but what it basically does is it replaces the built-in um, differenti differentiation mechanism with a map 
which is a really clever thing that I believe I attribute here to Chris Wagner. Um, I don't know if he got it from somewhere else, but um, you literally can just give it a, a dictionary such that theta maps to theta dot and so on and so forth. And then from all time, um, this function will uh, know how to properly do your derivatives and you will not be burdened with lots of ugly dependent variables. So that's just kind of one of the things that this wrapper layer provides. So now to the actual thing that I wanted to show. Um, Lagrange's planetary equations, so these are the, the standard method of derivation is you take a three-dimensional central force motion field, you have two sets of coordinates, one of which is uh, Keplerian orbital elements, so you have your normal three Euler angles, the longitude of the ascending node, the argument of periapsis, and um, the inclination. Uh, you have the fast angle, which is the true anomaly. You package these together into the argument of latitude. And then you also have a spherical coordinate system, lambda, phi usually, or sometimes flipped, but phi in this case is going to be the zenith angle. And so we are interested in a non-canonical transformation of Hamilton's equations such that we get differential equations in the um, Keplerian orbital elements. And... Uh, yeah, this, that sounds like a horrible thing to do by hand, and it is, so let's just let the computer do it. So here's the setup. I'm going to define a position vector based on my spherical angles. I'm going to differentiate it in the inertial frame uh, with respect to time, and then I'm going to define a Lagrangian, which is just, this is missing a factor of a half, um, plus my central force motion, plus the whatever perturbation. So in this case, the perturbation is gonna be called U1, and it's going to be parameterized by the spherical angle, by the spherical coordinates, R phi and lambda. So this is the setup. It's fairly important, um, just like with all symbolic packages, you have to tell uh, SymPy what assumptions to make about uh, the various things that you're doing. Uh, and so um, here we have the semi major axis, the eccentricity, the gravitational parameter, and the orbital radius. These are all real values. These are all strictly positive. Then you have a whole bunch of angles, which are all real, but not necessarily positive. Uh, and then you have their derivatives, which again are strictly real, but not necessarily positive. You have your perturbing function. And here I will use the function um, functionality built into SymPy. Uh, and then you will have your conjugate momenta and your transformed Hamilton-Jacobi conjugate uh, momenta. And then finally, the transformed Hamilton-Jacobi constants, uh, which are the uh, transformed generalized coordinates. So we are just, this, is, this whole thing is just the setup of all the variables to use. Uh, here we set up the position vector. So it's going to be a matrix of exactly as written here. Um, and then we differentiate it. And so this diff total mat is just a wrapper around the total differentiation function that I previously showed you in my SymPy helpers code. And it just goes iteratively through a, an iterable, in this case, a matrix type uh, defined in SymPy and applies the total derivative to each of them. I can then define the unperturbed Lagrangian, which is v dotted, the velocity dotted of itself, dotted by two plus the central force potential. And then the true Lagrangian is the uh, unperturbed Lagrangian plus the perturbation function. And so when I execute all of this, um, I'm just showing the outputs here. Uh, here we go. So here's my position vector. Here's my velocity vector in spherical coordinates. And here's my perturbed Lagrangian. And here is really, this is why I like Jupiter and SymPy, because now I will show this math as tech commands. And now I get this beautiful box of tech commands that I will copy and I will paste it into my favorite tech compiler. And I won't actually do it, but I have done it. And then I will have my beautiful slides with all of the things that SymPy has very nicely generated for me in the exact format that I like with over dots and, and things like that. So here we go. So everything that I just did is the contents of this slide. Um, obviously, then I do a little bit extra work to make the slide look nice, but uh, the math part is taken care of completely. Uh, and so that's the basic workflow. Um, I'm just going to go through a couple of more points here because it's interesting. Uh, I should circle back for a second uh, and talk about these assumptions. Um, one of the somewhat annoying things about uh, SymPy is that it's very formally mathematically correct. Like you, you can tell which pieces are written by mathematicians and which pieces are written by dynamicists. So the base system is definitely written by mathematicians because everything is complex in SymPy. 
Um, so even when something is real, that just means that its imaginary part is strictly zero. It is still complex. And so any operation that's going to trigger a conjugate operator, like for example, a norm, is going to leave you with lots and lots of absolute values, which is fine. That's correct. But I don't, I really don't care. I really want to simplify out the absolute values. And so just like with almost all symbolic packages, you end up spending a lot of time tricking SymPy into simplifying for you. But uh, it is very worthwhile to take a look at the assumptions that things carry. So if you define something as just a symbol in SymPy, the only thing that, the only assumption it carries is that it's a commutative. Um, you actually have to try pretty hard to force SymPy to make something non-commutative. Like you have to explicitly tell it that something is non-commutative. Um, but that's the only assumption a base symbol carries. Uh, if I define, um, sorry, if I just, if I tack on a real to here, you will see that I instantly get a whole bunch of additional things and it is now complex, confusingly, despite the fact that I called it real, but its imaginary part is, its imaginary is false. So everything is correct, right? So real numbers are complex if, you know, you spend your life in the lot hall for those of us from Cornell. Um, and uh, so that's just an annoying thing. And then you can additionally tack on things like positive equals true and your attribute list grows even more. <laughs> uh, so this, it's, it's always interesting to dig into these things. Um, uh, well, I talked about how my own wrapper makes things notationally nice for me. Um, so just as an example for that, frequently um, in the style of newton lower dynamics that I do, we will be defining, we will do everything in component land, right? And so we will define vectors that are always strict Euclidean vectors that have forms like this. Uh, and so this is not a vector, right? Despite what SymPy is telling you, that's, that's, it's a matrix, actually, sorry, SymPy is being completely correct about this. This isn't a vector, it's a matrix, right? These are the components of a vector with respect to a specific reference frame, which you know, like 90% of the time, you're only dealing with a single reference frame for your problem. Um, and uh, so it's, it's fairly implicit. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, it turns out that 3D rigid body dynamics are the like other 10% of the time when you're never dealing with a single reference frame. And so you always want to be super careful about what frame your components are respect to notationally when you're writing stuff up. And so I never want to write out these matrices. Um, in, in the final product of what I'm doing, right? What I really want is either matrix with some subscript that delineates the frame that these are components in, or preferentially, I just wanna state this as the actual vector. And the actual vector has um, a basis to it, right? And so I have a little piece of code that just goes through and nicely outputs this by default in say the standard basis. Or if I happen to be working on some non-standard basis, like so. Right, and so if you didn't catch what was happening, what's happening is just the measure numbers, of course, stay the same, and the things that are being changed are the representations of my basis vectors, which are all assumed to be unit vectors, multiplying out the um, the measure numbers. And then you can get fancy because Jupiter lets you do that and put this in a spherical frame, where my basis set is e theta e phi e rho which is zero in this case. And so this is a previously defined thing. This is so you can just define pure tech. So it looks like this in the back end, and then Jupiter will very nicely output it in the format that you like. And so again, now I just show this as tech or whatever else I might be working in, copy paste, and my slides or that equation of my paper is done. So to pop back to the motivating example, which was um, Lagrange's equations. Um, I should also, again, this sheet is available as part of my course notes, which are all in GitHub and Chase will, I assume, post a link to that as well for people who are actually interested. Um, there's a lot of derivation in here that's just doing the Hamilton-Jacobi transformation, which gives you the del and A elements, which are canonical orbital elements, which like nobody uses because who cares? Um, because we understand Kepler and nobody really understands Delaunay. and a. Uh, There's a couple of things in here where you're just convincing yourself that things simplify because, hey, here are those absolute values that I was talking about. <laughs> that won't go away. But sine i cosine theta over ab sine i abs cosine theta should go away, as should the things inside of this um, 
uh, of these square roots. So you have to, you, you do have to do some simplification by hand, but eventually you get to a point where you have the delta elements. And then the actual derivation of Lagrange's equations happens to be pure linear algebra because you, it's, as I said, it's a non-symplectic um, transformation. And so, uh, sorry, it's a non-canonical transformation, which means that you use, you take advantage of the symplectic form of Hamilton's equations and you pre-multiply them by a, an, any arbitrary non-symplectic matrix that is the Jacobian of the transformation that you're interested in. So the specific transformation that we're interested in here is mapping from the canonical Delaunay elements to uh, Keplerian elements, which happens to be non-canonical. Um, and so we need to evaluate the Jacobian of that transformation which is another thing that computers are fantastic at. So I set up two states. I have my uh, matrix of, these are the Delaunay elements written in terms of um, Keplerian elements. Y1 is the matrix of the Keplerian elements that I wish to transform to. And then I also have a Z and a Y, which is a matrix of the Delaunay elements in their, um, their I'm just calling them uh, betas and alphas here. And then I have a matrix of the inverse of Y. So this is the Keplerian elements written in terms of Delaunay elements. And so here, this is what it looks like. So this is Kepler, Keplerian elements in terms of Delaunay elements. And the angles are all the same, but the actions all have functional forms. And then I just use a built-in to evaluate the, Jaco evaluate the Jacobian. And this is it. And this is like a typical exam question in these types of classes. Like, how do you know that Keplerian elements are non-canonical? Well, this is a non symplectic matrix, right? We don't have a strictly skew symmetric structure to it. We have off diagonal elements. And so just by inspection, you know that you're gonna get a non, a non canonical version of Hamilton's equations. You define the Hamiltonian, the transformed Hamiltonian, which is your uh, constant of motion minus the um, original potential, which includes the perturbation. And so this is what it looks like. And then the final result is the gradient in K with respect to X, uh, which looks like this. So this is the gradient in all of the Keplerian elements of the perturbation, and you're still carrying along your total energy here. And as a final step, you do this uh, final transformation, which is you define a symplectic matrix rather ham-fistedly, do some linear algebra, do some simplification, and here you go. These are Lagrange's planetary equations, which I don't know why I would expect anybody to recognize those on site, but that's what they look like. Um, and so if you, you know, ever took spacecraft mechanics as an undergrad, somebody would have just handed you these equations and said, here, use these. They're magic. They come out of thin air. But they don't. They're actually a 32-element SymPy notebook or Jupyter notebook. That's all it takes. Um, <laughs> because there's actually, like, the only tedious thing about all of this is crunching through all the algebra, right? The mechanics of it are relatively straightforward um, once you have the basic concepts. Uh, in your head. And so, and again, like this just obviates the need for any of that mechanical crunching. You copy, you paste it, and you make your nice slides. There you go. So that's it. So um, since I started doing this, I feel like my, like just the mathematical typesetting part of work has been reduced by about a factor of three or four, which is nice. Um, and so there's a lot of pretty powerful things that you can do with this setup. Uh, and um, all of the uh, underlying code and all of the outputs actually are up on GitHub. As I said, I'll provide Jace with links to those, but I'm happy to chat about this stuff now or about cool Beamer tricks to produce nice, nice slide decks if anybody's more interested in that. Um, so I think I'm more or less on time, so I guess I'll pause here. Thank you. Does anyone have questions about anything other than math? No, I have a math question. <laughs> okay, yes, go ahead with the math question. <laughs> so, um, uh, I was uh, wondering about your matrix to vector function. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, I, I'm just used to do linear algebra by actually calling three components in a reference frame, I actually do call them a vector. So I was confused that the output of your matrix to vector gives me an equation where the uh, symbols are uh, in addition already. I, I would right. call that something like an equation of state or something like that. 
so um, I, I agree with you that a, a vector is a matrix plus a reference frame definition. I, I 100% agree with that statement. It's what typically people leave out the reference frame definition and just call the matrix the vector, right? So just an array of three numbers, it, people often call a vector, which is fundamentally incorrect. Um, yeah, so, but, but um, then uh, this function seems to yes. go a step too, too far, well, doesn't it? I mean, this is, I guess it's a some, in some sense, a philosophical question, but um, so E, I assume that, let me just simplify this a little bit and maybe make this full. Okay, so I explicitly in my head, when I define this matrix, I'm thinking of it with respect to a particular frame. That mm -hmm. frame, let's say it happens to be the standard basis. And so, um, Right. If you were carrying this along as a matrix, you'd be carrying it along as a matrix plus the definition of the stand, of the reference frame or basis set of unit vectors that these components are defined with respect to. Right. And so, if this happens to be in some inertial frame whose definition is the vector triad e1, e2, e3, then multiplying them out gives me the equivalent expression. Right. So this matrix plus reference frame definition is in fact some measure number in the E1 direction plus some measure number in the E2 direction plus some measure number in the E3 direction. Ah, okay, so the, out, the, uh, the, the function always would uh, add the uh, unit vectors here only and not something that's, that's more That's the point of this complex. function. That's right. Okay. The, the only thing this is doing is doing a matrix multiplication of this with a vectrix, effectively. I, I personally hate vectrices, so I don't think of it that way, but, but that's, in the back end, that's what's happening, right? I, the back end is generating a vectrix composed of three unit vectors um, and then just doing the cross multiplication. I even have never heard the term vectrix. Uh, so vectrix I still, is- I still uh, survived. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just, um, this is, I believe uh, due to Hughes might be the earliest um, version of it, but yeah, it's just a stack of, a stack of unit vectors. Sometimes uh -huh. in rigid body dynamics are referred to as a vectrix. Okay, and uh, the uh, the, really the usability question now here is, if I wanna use these components in NumPy calculations, mm -hmm. would I use what you called in, in cell 30 vector or would I need to, uh, I mean, how can I, it, it, this equation with the additions doesn't seem to be immediately reusable by NumPy, that's why I'm puzzled. Fair enough, yes, this is, this, the way that I use it is this is the final output step. This is just for, um, this, this would be, yeah, I would do all of my operations on these guys, but when I write code, I mean, let me just pop up an example. Um, um, sorry, let me find a relevant, okay, here we go. So um, here's an example where I'm explicitly juggling different uh, basis sets. Um, some very related problem. Um, right, so here we go. So here's uh, somewhere where I need to explicitly differentiate across frames, right? And so I, um, this might actually be a poor example because I'm not being very careful <laughs> about notation here, but um, if you follow through the logical flow, um, all of the operations are occurring on the, um, on the matrices, right? Mm -hmm. But I have, I bookkeep which matrix is, uh, corresponds to which frame. And so at the end of the day, if I want to output this in my preferred notation, then I use that mat to function as a final step just for output purposes. But the actual me mechanism, the derivation itself is proceeding using the matrices, but then you just have to do additional bookkeeping to make sure that you're never um, representing things in the incorrect frame. Yeah. This is this might totally be only terminology. Uh, I remember in the early days of NumPy, there was a lot of discussion as well in terms of what's vector multiplication, what's matrix multiplications, and uh, which yeah. one is actually implemented and how do we call it. And sure. I think there was a little bit of a sloppy time there. Fascinatingly, um, SymPy actually carries two almost separate vector definitions because there's a physics vector definition in SymPy and then there's a dynamics uh -huh. vector definition. And okay. the reason for the different, they're not really different, they're, they're building on the same backends, but um, the different people who wrote the documentation talk about them differently. And so in mechanics, you care about vector differentiation with respect to frames and it's always with respect to time. And then in 
um, other physics contents, you don't care that much. You, so you, you care more about uh, metric differentiations. And so uh, the language is a little bit different. And so the outputs look a little bit different. Um, mm -hmm. and, so, and this is just within the same package, weirdly enough. Okay. I want to give other people a chance <laughs> for a question, but I would have one more to, to your wrapper. But let, let first other people come in if they have questions. I oh, think this okay. might have been a talk geared only towards you. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> well, I, I'm, um, I guess uh, many people of us uh, work in spacecraft, but uh, I'm, I'm currently uh, also trying to get a little bit deeper in it for, for ring dynamics mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and resonances, trying to understand them. And it's, it's like a little bit more math than I'm used to. So I'm, I'm thinking of maybe trying it this way. So. Mm -hmm. just to help myself so oh, yeah. i was wondering for, for your for your wrapper this map as like uh, if i if i wouldn't be much into simpy i would be scared in you know breaking the math system of simpy so how how can you convince me that this map is only a display thing it's like how how would i see that which mapping are you talking about the differentiation uh, mapping or the, uh, the, the for, exa final for example the the dotted thing which i totally agree it's it's, yeah. it's hard to okay. look at all these d over dt's so if you look at what it's actually doing, um, we are never getting away from the uh, back-end der der differentiation of functionality of SymPy, right? So what you will see is that it's really just a series of search and replaces, right? So what happens is you are doing a substitution of each element of the string with the thing that's being differentiated as defined in the, in the differentiation map that you feed it, right? Then you will run the differential with respect to whatever you're differentiating by. And then you will generate a map of all the things that need, that need to get replaced back and do that substitution again. So you're not manually doing any differentiation. You're literally doing a bunch of search and replaces back and forth, right? Which is why this is so clever. And again, I didn't come up with this. This is by somebody named Chris Wagner. Um, but you're not, you're not manually implementing any differentiation. You're literally just saying, if yeah. you see an X, it becomes an X dot, right? Or whatever the diff map says. And, um, and then here's the interesting question, uh, the, the resulting object. With, yeah. a, with a dot, can it be fed without another converter back to SymPy, or do we need to rerun the reconversion? In, in order to do what? To, to manipulate it further? I, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's a, no, it's a native SymPy object. The problem is that if you then try to use the normal SymPy differentiation methods, SymPy has no idea that those x dots or the x's are functions of a dependent variable. So ah, you're kind means of. I need to use your wrapper for yes. differentiation. Yeah. So you okay. just need to be consistent, right? So like okay. anytime okay. you differentiate that object, yes, you once you go down this road, you have to stick with it. Um, okay. Okay. But everything else, algebraically, other calculus operations, it's fine. Yeah, and and then is is it then a rabbit hole? Meaning, like the more equations I need to use, the more wrappers I need to write. Not necessarily. I, this is really kind of. This is the only one that replaces calculus functions. The rest of the stuff that's in here um, is, I, I've just implemented the transport equation, which is um, differentiation across reference frames, uh, standard rotation matrix set, and then um, just useful things. Like the, the rest of the stuff in here are utilities. This is really okay. the only thing that's replacing uh, native functionality. Okay, all right, sounds cool. Thanks. Um I've been dealing with some dynamics problems in a calibration pipeline recently that are very, very conceptually straightforward to solve in closed form. So I've been using SymPy on them, but it's super slow. Do you mm -hmm. have any tips about moving from SymPy solution to a vectorized form? Super slow in terms of evaluating them in mathematically? Terms of evaluating them at given, yeah. Well, okay, so I would, let me see if I, so, I mean, a couple of things. You need to lambda -fy the expressions before running them. Do you do that? Or do you just substitute I'm, it? I'm, kind of, I'm at the beginning of any optimization steps. Sure, so, um, sorry, I'm, my memory is, I'm trying to remember where I would have an example. Um, Probably would be in a homework uh, now that I think about it, um, but I'm not seeing. 
for some reason. Let's see. Uh, so there's two useful things that I've come across um, and uh, neither one of them is really like going to be a panacea for all the issues, but um, let me just see if this is a relevant thing. <sighs> Why can't I find, sorry. Um, this might not be relevant. Um, anyway, so once you have a, a um, a SymPy object, an equation, right? You can call lambda phi on it, which literally just turns it into a native lambda function. Um, and that'll be much faster in terms of numerical execution than, uh, than just substituting numbers in. Um, this is clearly the wrong example. Um, and then the other thing, the other cool thing, and this is actually getting away from pure Python is there's in SymPy, there's something called code gen. And CodeGen will generate uh, code for you in a variety of languages, including C, Fortran, and Octave, but it will be fully MATLAB compatible code. And so if you really just want to implement something blazingly fast, then you generate the symbolic expressions in SymPy, you use CodeGen to give you C code, and then, you know, Andrew was telling us about his dislike for Cython, but Cython is actually fantastic uh, for making things super fast. Um, so, oh, I wasn't dissing Cython. It's definitely fast. Well, it's it's cumbersome. I agree. But when somebody else when somebody else is generating the C code for you, it doesn't matter how ugly the C code is, and then you just dump it sight unseen into a Cythonized wrapper, and that will be the absolute best performance you can hope to squeeze out of out of the actual evaluations. But as a first step, I would just try lambda defying things, and so it's it's literally. I believe it's just lambda defy. Mm. Maybe not. Nope. Okay. I'll, I'll look it up and I will get it to you offline, <laughs> but um, it's a built-in uh, utility.